All right, let's jump on in here from the drum booth. And here we are at my uh, Amic Angela 2 mixing console. This is an old British mixing board from around 1995. They made these over in UK and uh, I'm not sure how this one ended up in Hawaii, but somebody went through a lot of trouble to get it here. It was not me. I bought it here from someone who was leaving the island. And uh, it's been great. I updated my old system into this and it's a big old uh, 32 channel mixing console. And it's all analog. There's nothing digital about it. Um, it's very old school. Not that old school. 1995 isn't that old as far as consoles go, but uh, I like it. It serves me, serves my purpose as well. Um, I won't go too much into the detail of the mixing board today. Um, I could talk about this mixing board uh, for a whole video, but uh, today we're just going to talk about the drums and how, uh, how I quickly like to bring up uh, drum microphones and get the session started uh, without spending hours and hours on setup. Um, the band has just come in and they're ready to go and uh, the drums are already mic'd up and ready to go. Uh, so I literally come in here and push up some faders and arm some tracks in the DAW and we start recording uh, usually within, uh, it, I could get going within 10 minutes or so, honestly, uh, but usually we'll take longer than that to set up a band. But if the drummer's just coming in to do just drums, uh, we could get him going in 10, 15 minutes and with not much problem, unless he's bringing in his own kit. That of course takes more time to set up as I just discussed earlier. If the bass player wants to play along, we can uh, put him usually in the control room right behind me. I rarely use bass amps anymore. They're just so big and noisy and they, they blast the whole foundation of the house and they get into all the other microphones. So I really am a big fan of using uh, direct boxes and uh, uh, amp simulators. And I've even got an old uh, uh, Sans amp uh, rack mount. It's really kind of old, but it, sound, it's, it sounds as good as any cabinet, honestly, without all the headaches and no microphones involved. Uh, there's some great plugins I'll go into also on another channel. I mean, another uh, video about uh, guitars and bass. Uh, but today, here's drums. Um, as you see down here, I've got my track sheet. I usually put out some um, blue painter's tape that doesn't stick too much like masking tape, so it comes off easily. Uh, and uh, put down, I usually double it up. I usually do a double stick of that, and you write your, uh, your drums on here. I go all the way at bass, keys, guitars, but down here on these first 12 channels, if you're seeing that, I'll do um, all drums. I do two kicks, uh, two, two mics on the kick drum, two mics on the snare drum as we looked at earlier. Uh, usually three tom-toms, maybe four tom-toms if somebody's got a bigger kit, but three tom-toms in my case. Uh, and a hi-hat and ride mic, spot mic, separate uh, I've showed you that in the in the drum room. And then I do my room mic, which is the drummer's talkback microphone right there in mono. That's the one right over the drummer's shoulder. And then my overhead microphones last on 11 and 12. That's a little bit of an uncon unconventional track layout, but that's how I do it. And you can, there's no rules about that. I just like that layout. I like it because 11 and 12 end up as a matched pair. So in my DAW, they come up as 11 and 12. I can do that as a stereo pair. But uh, however you want to do it, whatever you're comfortable with here, that's how I set it up. And then I get into my bass keys and all that stuff over here. So 12, 12 mics on the drum kit, uh, a front head on the kick, then the outside or the back side, or you can tell that the top and the bottom, as indicated by an arrow up or an arrow down. That's kind of the standard way to do that. Same with the snare, the snare top mic, snare bottom mic. As you can see, I don't usually, I usually use that one in a lot of recordings. And then my tom-toms, those are all just single mics, those, uh, uh, those um, Audix uh, mics I showed you. The hi-hat and the ride are both the um, Rode NT5s, or any decent condenser and pencil microphone you have. Or if you don't have a condenser, you can do use, a, use a dynamic like a SM57, or even a 58 if you're in a pinch. Uh, the Room is an Audio-Technica large diaphragm microphone. It was about a $300 microphone that I still use for the drum overheads, I mean the drum uh, room. And that's primarily my talkback mic for the communication between me and the drummer. So like I said, when I'm recording, I just mute that. Now, these are mute switches here, by the way. Those aren't solo switches. Uh, interesting thing about this board is it doesn't have any big solo switches. 
Uh, I guess that wasn't, uh, that's more of a something that came along later with SSL. The solo switches are in there, they're just very small, and you gotta, I wish that's one of the only things I don't like about this mixing board is those little teeny solo buttons. They should be nice big square buttons like the mutes. But small price to pay. Um, the problem with those is that the uh, stereo bus assign is right next to it. So to make it go to the left right fader, you have to press those stereo bus buttons down. It's really easy to inadvertently hit one of those when you're mixing down. All of a sudden your, your kick drum isn't going to the stereo mix and you don't notice it because the buttons are so small. So I rarely use the solo buttons because of that. If I do, I'm very careful to get in and get out of there. It's just one of the little design flaws on this old board, but I'll, I'll use the mutes because they're big and easy to see. I'll be more apt to, if I wanted to mute one microphone, I'll be, I'll, or solo one microphone, I'll be more apt to mute the channels around it <laughs> instead of soloing that one. So when I get a nice big SSL console, I won't have to worry about that for today. We're not, we're not on that. Um, and then up here, the way this mixing board flows, at the top, uh, you've got your input assign. I can assign any microphone input uh, to any channel. Channel one doesn't have to, microphone one doesn't have to go down through channel one. I can assign it from up there to any other uh, input I like, one through 24, or several of them if I wanted to. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but I could have, I could have one microphone ass assigned to all the channels or as many channels as I wanted for if you wanted to do that. But usually I just assign one to one, two to two, and so forth. And then coming down, these are the effects sends as well as headphone sends. Those serve two purposes. It's pretty standard. Uh, there's four effects sends, or you can have four different uh, stereo uh, headphone mixes, or a combination of both. I'll usually have uh, one basic reverb, one or two reverbs right here that I'll use for, excuse me, on the top one, I'll use, I've got a couple different verbs on that uh, for headphone uh, he reverb only. And then down below that, I've got uh, my main headphone here going to the, uh, the vocal booth. And then uh, these guys are going to the, uh, a little uh, output box that I've got right here in the control room. For anybody that's in the control room, I can give them their own little headphone mix. And then the bottom one goes into the drum booth so I can give the drummer his own mix as well. And all of those have a stereo panning underneath them so I can adjust the stereo split on those if I want to create a stereo image, or I can just leave them dead center if it doesn't matter for a mono mix. Then down below that, this is an EQ input EQ section. Beautiful British style uh, EQ. Um, it's a little different than a lot of EQs you might have seen. Uh, you've got two fully sweepable uh, parametric EQs in the middle and the top and the bottom are um, fixed or shelving type EQ. So you've got a high and a low, which are shelving, fixed. And you can adjust a little bit on those with the, the buttons, which uh, frequencies you want. In the middle, you've got fully sweepable, um, high frequency, uh, I should, high, high mids, I should say, and then low mids. Very musical, easy for me to get in there and adjust um, instruments and drums that way. I don't tend to EQ drums very much coming in from the microphones. Uh, I like the way those microphones sound as they are. Uh, I'll do a couple things to them on input that I record. Very basic though, uh, one of the only things I'll do is maybe a high pass filter on those cymbals, those overhead cymbals. Uh, I might want to engage that as you see here. I've got a low frequency uh, high pass filter uh, right there on those overheads so I'm not getting all that so much kick drum and stuff like that in the low frequency. You could also do that here, you could roll off lows if you wanted there, but I don't, I don't need all that low end on my overheads. Uh, other than that, the same goes on the bottom snare mic. I hit that low pass, that high pass filter to get rid of that kick drum sitting there right next to it. So I, I engage that to get rid of some of that rumble in the hi-hat, excuse me, in the um, bottom snare mic. Uh, sometimes I do it on the top snare mic, but I prefer to do that when I mix down because there's sometimes there's some low end in that, that um, snare drum that I want to keep on my recording and I can always notch that out on mix down. Uh, same goes for the hi-hat. I'll drop a high pass filter on the hi-hat because obviously you don't need a lot of low end on that. But as you can see, I don't really have a lot of, a lot going on on the, really anything going on on any of my microphone inputs. The mics I've chosen carefully uh, and they're positioned correctly. So I, I'm a big fan of kind of recording things, uh, at, you know, au naturel coming in and then EQing on mix down. Um, in a live situation, that's gonna be different. 
you're going to want to, you got one chance to get it right. So you're going to do a lot of more EQ when you're tracking. Uh, there's engineers that are going to totally disagree with me and, and uh, um, that want to EQ uh, a lot on recording. Uh, and they get the sound more when they're tracking and then do less work on mix down. So you can do that too, if you prefer. It's really a matter of preference. I kind of like recording a little bit more open and then kind of, if I, if I like the way it sounds coming in, I don't need to EQ it much. You don't have to EQ just to be EQing. Uh, maybe try not EQing you know, so much, you know. We spend a lot of time doing that. Listen to, the, listen to the drum before you reach for the EQ. Does it sound good? Or are you just reaching for the EQ kind of out of habit? Below the EQ, we get into our preamps. These are the Amic preamps, these little red guys. Uh, they're really nice sounding preamps. They don't look very special, but a lot of guys overlook that when they come in the studios. They go right for the racks to see what kind of uh, outboard gear and preamps I've got over there. But these little guys over here, um, the, the German guy that sold it to me, he, he described them as, as being a poor man's Neve uh, console. So I, I like the way it, that, was, uh, that was put. I don't think Rupert Neve had too much to do with the design of this board. I know that Rupert had some involvement with the Amic company. I think they were in the same neighborhood in England, uh, but uh, he might have had some uh, over some involvement in the design of these Amic consoles. But uh, his name is not on them. But there's a little bit of a history about that. Anyway, these preamps sound great. There's a couple of them that uh, I, you know sometimes are a little bit crackly. So I take I do take note of which ones are better than others. And uh, you know it's an old console. There's going to be some some stuff like that. Uh, down below it, these are just the uh, pan panning volume. That, that basically determines what it goes to, uh, like I've, I've got it panned all the way over to the left, that's gonna go onto channel one. If I pan that up the middle, it would start to get over onto channel two. And then if I went all the way over like that, it would be on channel two. So usually I just keep those hard left and right across the board. I rarely go in there and adjust those for any reason, because you don't need to. Uh, I'll show you one in a second. That's gonna be, your, your panning is gonna be down here in this section of the board. But um, anyway, so that's gonna assign that, that microphone one coming down through your EQ, your preamp, uh, onto your fader. This is your output fader, the way this board works. Uh, and that's gonna determine the level that goes to your tape deck, or more recently into your, your digital audio workstation that's gonna be your overall volume. So you, you basically set your, your volume or your preamp with that knob, get that where you want it, how, it's, how you want it to sound. If you're driving the preamp a little harder or even going for distortion or you want something really low, get your, get your tone with that preamp and your EQ. And then that determines uh, not what you're listening to, but the level that's going to the uh, DAW. It's little, like, basically an output fader, like you might have on a plug-in. That's what that is. Okay. Uh, and I usually park those around the zero point or the unity point uh, right there. So when, when, I, when I'm first setting up, I just bring up all my drum faders to zero, all 12 of them. And I'm ready to go. I've already got the EQs like I want. I've already got uh, the any filters I've got. Uh, usually I'll turn off the, uh, any phantom power that I need, which in this case isn't much. I just need phantom power going to that outside kick microphone, that Audio Technica 4033, that's a powered mic. Going on over, I need some power going to the bottom snare mic. That's that NT5 that needs phantom power. And then moving on down the Tom Toms, these guys right here, the hi-hat and the ride, those are both um, powered microphones as well. The NT5 on the ride, and as I recall, the uh, Audio Technica 51 on the hi hat. And then the room, actually, there's more phantom power than I thought. The room does require, that's that Audio Technica, that requires phantom power. Turn that on. And then right here, the overheads, the, the audio, the Audix. Uh, 51s both require phantom power. So those those are all phantom powered mics. You're supposed to turn off phantom power when you're not using it. I tell everybody to do that to avoid damaging ribbon microphones. But um, as you can see, I've let, I leave those on, to be honest with you guys. I tend to leave phantom power on. So I have never had any problems ever with microphone damage. So I, I guess I'm doing something right, but 
technically you should be turning on phantom power at the end of the session. I guess that's if you're gonna be plugging microphones in and out, you wanna avoid that loud pop on your speakers that you get if you've got phantom power going to it. But I'm rarely unplugging those microphones, so you don't need to do that. So that's gonna determine my output going to the DAW. And as you can see, I've got those all at zero, so I'm really determining my output more with my pre, but usually I'll do that. And then if, that if when I'm recording, if I need to fine tune it or trim it a little bit, like while the track is going down, I won't touch the preamp. I'll leave that alone and just nudge it a little bit with my fader. If I, it's a little hot, I can bring it down there, a skosh or push it up. It's sort of like the aileron trim on an airplane. You know, you've got, you're flying at the right altitude. You don't need to touch the wheel or the yoke, I guess you call it. They've got some, a little trim switch in there. They just adjust the little flap a little bit on the, on the wing just for a slight adjustments. So that's kind of what I think of these are as just trim, trim knobs. Um, within this section right here, I'll go over that real quick. You've got the top is the phantom power. There's a pad. That's if you need a line input. Uh, below that is a phase switch. Uh, these are stereo mix buttons, which you're not using here. Those would put that into the stereo mix, which you don't want in this particular case. Uh, there's a way to flip this board uh, to, in to include these faders on mixto and to double the, the channel count from 32 to 64. So you can have all these as part of your mix, but that's kind of a different story. Uh, so those are up. You don't want to, you don't want to be hearing those. Uh, and then uh, solo switches right there, little teeny little solo switches. So you can check the mic there. Uh, this is part, this, these little red knobs are not operable here. They're part of an antiquated, uh, very early uh, uh, automation, early automation system. It was called Super True. And it was one of the first, uh, this is one of the first consoles that had something like that. It wasn't flying fader automation. It simply told you uh, with a little pair of uh, red, yellow, and green lights, uh, when you came back to the a session and re reloaded the session, uh, it wouldn't pop all the faders back to where you wanted them. What it would do is tell you uh, if you push the fader up, the computer would look and see if you were below or above or green meant that you were, uh, right where you left it. So you could kind of recall a pr your previous mixes with a really old PC computer. It was kind of funny. Uh, I won't go too much into it, but it was kind of an early automation system. It even had a very, one of the very first little plugins. It was these little teeny compressors. I don't, they weren't even called compressors. They were called Dynamics Control. And it was a very, very early uh, compressor on each channel. And they ha also had some very early uh, digital EQ. Super, super early plugin. Um, I'll, maybe I'll talk about this console and that a little bit uh, more some other time. But anyway, those little guys right there, those red buttons are no longer operable. I wish those were the solo buttons. Those are easy to see. But below that, mute switches if you need to mute microphones. Like if the drummer was done, and, and, but he was taking a break and you're doing some bass overdubs, uh, but you don't want to pull down the faders, you could just mute all the drum mics like that and keep, keep those drum mics from ringing out, do the bass, and then when the drummer comes back from lunch, open those up. Those come in really handy. Below that, that also puts this into, it, it sends these, uh, instead of going to the computer and then back, it actually sends it straight on down into the, into the left-right mix. So I, I never use those either. Those should always be up. I want to talk about signal flow a little bit. It's going out of the uh, computer, excuse me, out of the mixing board to the tape deck or the computer. Um, I'll stop saying tape deck because we're not using tape decks anymore. So it's going out to the DAW, uh, being recorded in the DAW, and then coming back, basically right here. If you can imagine the signal coming back in right after this section. Uh, first thing you're going to do is you've got the same type of EQ that you've got up here, but this type isn't being recorded. This is just in your monitors. So this is where you can actually adjust what you're hearing. If you wanted to adjust what's going, being recorded, you would do it up there. And down here, this doesn't affect uh, any, anything except what you're hearing. So you can add a little high end or something for, for your pleasure, but uh, not being recorded. Basically anything below this line isn't gonna affect what's going to 
the uh, DAW. You could mute things, you can pan them, you can do whatever you want here and it's not gonna be recorded. Everything above there is gonna be recorded. So that's kind of something that's a little bit critical about working with uh, big old consoles. That's, they're all a little bit different but they basically all flow something like this. So you can EQ it, you've got the same controls down here that you do up here. Uh, uh, high pass filter, this is the EQ button. Like if you, if you don't have, if you have that up, whatever you do here is off. So you won't have, if you want no EQ, have those buttons up and it won't be EQ at all. It bypasses the EQ, EQ circuit entirely. Put them down, you've got EQ in your mix. Uh, panning left and right, mute like I talked about. This little guy is a preamp that reamplifies the signal that's coming back from the DAW. Uh, so there's a unity point in the middle, which is where I usually leave them at. But if you wanted to add a little bit more amperage, or if it was coming back a little hot, you could reduce it. But usually I leave those up the middle for the sake of uh, continuity during mix down, and then adjust my faders for volume. But you notice you need a little more, you know, you've got your, your kick drum all the way up and you need a little more out of it, you can crank it up there and use that preamp, which is kind of nice. All right, and then your faders, and those go to your stereo fader right here, which I record, I used to record to a DAT player. If you, any of your old school engineers remember DAT players, DAT players, that was my uh, mix down deck. Before that, guys would use half inch or quarter inch reel to reels, that was the medium for Mixing down, now, those were a lot of fun. They, they had a, a great tone. You could hit the, hit the two track really kind of hard and it would give you some natural tape compression, which sounded really great. Uh, they were a pain in the butt to work with, as is most tape. You had to deal with tape and all that, but they sounded great. They took up a big corner of the room. DAT players were a lot smaller uh, and they were, there was no hiss or noise to worry about. There were other things to worry about, but not hiss. DAT players faded away for a long time. I recorded two uh, CD burners. I think I still have one up in the rack here, the old Alasis Masterlink. I used that for years after I got, re got retired my DAT player and I loved it. It had a little hard drive you could record into, put all your songs in there and not have to worry about burning a CD all at once uh, or pausing a CD burner. You could just burn, you could just uh, record your, your mixes into the little hard drive on the Masterlink and then assemble your songs and burn a CD after that. They were brilliant. I used them for a long time and they had really high sample rates. I think they went up to 96K or something like that. What I do now, and this is a big part of my recording flow, is I record, uh, all the tracks are coming back from my DAW, going to, mixing to this fader right here, and then that stereo output, I record straight back into the same DAW work project. So it's recording a stereo mix right back into the same um, project folder that I'm using. And that's, that could be, I'm using Digital Performer from Mark of the Unicorn. You could do that with Pro Tools, any, basically any DAW. You can hook it, you can rig it out so your output, your stereo mix from that fader goes, records right back into your computer. Um, it, would, it would go through, obviously, through your uh, interface. It'll take up two channels of your interface. That way they're always stored right with the project. Every mix you do, you can just put them right there and then do a new take if you want another mix and keep on adding takes in your little project folder there. That's my new workflow. So that is the basic inputs from drums. As you can see, I'm not getting into mixing or anything like that right now. I'm just showing you how to, how to bring up uh, the faders right away, arm your tracks in the DAW, turn on any phantom power or apply an EQ if you want it. I usually have it so it's ready to go. Like I said, I've got all 12, 12 channels uh, ready to go. I just bring up these faders, arm the tracks in the DAW, and hit record, and you're recording drums. Maybe plug in a bass, scratch vocal in a guitar, or something like that, and we've got a session within, you know, 10, 15 minutes instead of two hours. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to see more, please consider joining my recording studio forum. It's full of tips and tricks, as well as my personal advice on how to improve your studio and keep your clients happy and productive. Now, all my videos and tutorials will be in one convenient place, and any new material will be added there as it grows. I'm offering it all to you right now at a special early bird discount. I'm going to leave you some quick links to the products I've discussed, as well as the gear I use in my studio every single day. 
Mahalo for your kind support and aloha from Hawaii.